Thank you for joining us for this episode. Uh, we are excited to have Azinda Moro joining us today, and we're going to be talking about what happens when you stop myopia management treatment on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, Zinda Morrow's here with us. How are you, my friend? Hello, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Zinda and I did a webinar earlier this year, and um, we uh, we also she she got to lecture at the academy on uh, on myopia management. Uh, congratulations! That's a huge uh, accomplishment to get to do that. Yeah, thank you. I was nervous, but I'm glad I uh, had some great co-speakers with me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a great session. So Azinda, you are relatively new to the speaking circuit and to the KOLs, to writing and doing webinars and stuff. So uh, not a lot of people may know you and your background. Uh, they may have recognized you and so forth. So tell us a little bit about who you are, where you practice and a little of your background. Yeah, sure. So, um, so as you can, this is my hometown behind me. So I'm originally from California and currently practicing in California, uh, specifically in Santa Clara, California, which is like in the South Bay area. So I've been at the practice. So this is a private practice for the last year. Um, and so I see patients of all ages doing primary care, a lot of myopia management, as well as specialty contact lens fitting. And before I came back to California, I was actually on faculty at SUNY for four years. Uh, that's also where I graduated from after doing a contact lens residency at Illinois College of Optometry. So uh, when I was at the college, uh, at SUNY specifically, I was doing a lot of myopia and specialty contact lenses as well, uh, in addition to some research in our clinical research center. So I've kind of been jumping all over the nation, but like I mentioned, back in California for the last year, and it's been nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, you know your your practice is uh, is a, a a bit of a bigger practice, if I remember right, isn't it? It is. We have six doctors, all ODs, um, OD owned and operated for decades. Uh, so mm -hmm. we have patients who've been coming for decades also. It's a great practice. And like I mentioned, they actually already did a lot of myopia management and specialty lenses prior to my arrival. So it was a really great fit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely a, a great practice with a great reputation and you're already crushing it and, and, and uh, uh, have, have done your stint in academia and now you're in clinical practice. You, you did your residency at SUNY, correct? Is that that's what you said? I graduated from SUNY and then did my residency at ICO. At ICO wow. and then you went back to SUNY. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Hectic, but it was fun. <laughs> yeah. So when you were at uh, at SUNY, what kind of things were you teaching and patients were you seeing and so forth? Yeah, I got pretty lucky in that when I first started at SUNY, there was a contact lens faculty who, although we like loved him, he actually left the college at the time that I was joining. And so that kind of opened a great door for me in that I was able to start in the specialty lens clinic pretty early. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of my week was seeing, you know, patients with irregular cornea, uh, high prescriptions, complicated prescriptions for contact lens fittings. Right. And I was also doing uh, myopia management clinically as well. So that's where I spent most of my time. And then, as I said, I there is a clinical research center at SUNY. So we did have some studies looking at myopia management new devices coming to market, um, you know, different technologies, contact. Yeah. Lines. So what kind of things uh, in the myopia space were you working on in the clinical research center? Like what kind of things did you learn in that? Yeah, it was actually a really cool opportunity because obviously like one of my hats was being on the clinic side and then the other hat was being on the research side. So I think seeing yeah. both ends was really cool. Um you know, we did, we had uh, studies looking at 
contacts as well as spectacle intervention. So we had a good variety of things that we were researching there. But I think what I learned from all of that is how intense it is to get, you know, products to market and to, you know, all that has to happen prior to anything seeing yeah. a patient clinically. For and sure. So true appreciation for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Cool. So now you're in practice and you've been doing myopia management, obviously for a long time. And now you've been at your practice a little while. Uh, you know, I, I know you get asked this question just like I do all the time is like, you know, what happens when we stop myopia management? Uh, how do we, how do we, how do we quit doing this? And you talked about this at, at the Academy, but, you know, to some degree, what, what we always think is the case, and you can speak to this with the different treatments is what we hope is that as a child is progressing in their myopia, that when we stop their treatment, when we start their treatment, it would be like pausing whatever situation was going to happen. And then when the when the kid picks up or excuse me, stops doing their myopia management for, from when they start to they stop that we've pretty well keep things as flat as possible as far as axial length and refractive error. But then when they stop doing treatment that they would just resume the progression as if nothing had ever had ever happened. And there's just that gap, that stop gap in space where we've intervened. And hopefully that's happening when they would have progressed their fastest. Um, with the treatments that we have had available, uh, you know, this rebound effect, you know, like maybe they become way more myopic when they stop treatment and so forth. You've looked at that. Have you thought about this as well? Is this something that's been forefront of your mind? And how do you... How do you answer that question for parents and so forth? Yeah, I think that's a, you know, it's super top of mind, I think, for a lot of us, because it is a question that we get asked all the time. Like the first time I introduced the topic of myopia management to families, oftentimes their first question is, well, how long do we have to do this for? So mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. Um, the other, you know, kind of piggyback question to that is, well, what if we change our mind a year from now, two years from now to switch treatments? And so I think that as, you know, the family gets used to your practice, as they start myopia management, their decisions mm -hmm. will change. The ch child's, um, you know, hobbies and activities will change. Finances may play a role that didn't before. And so all of these things are very real clinical you know, problems and dilemmas that we think yeah. about a lot. <laughs> so yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Well, so you, you looked into this a little bit. And so do you want to kind of walk us through the different treatments that are currently available and, you know, what you've learned in this process, either from research or clinical experience to what does happen when a, a child has stopped or, you know, quit myopia management? Yeah, I think from like a clinical, like personal perspective, I've had things go both ways in the sense that, you know, I've had families where they choose one treatment and then later switch and then they progress faster than they were on the first treatment. I've had patients stay stable um, in switching treatments. I've had some patients just discontinue treatment without telling me. And then I see them and they're like, I haven't been doing this for six months and they're yeah. stable or unstable. Like the permutations, at least from a personal perspective are just, there are numerous. Um, but to your question in looking at the research that I presented in my talk at the Academy, I think, you know, each type of myopia management that we do has some you know, different, different results. So if we look at atropine, um, there's been a couple of very large scale studies looking at atropine use for myopia management and the rebounds effects. Obviously with children, these studies have to be done very in depth over a long time because of the medication part of it. Yeah. So if we look at the ADAM2 study, those were patients who were on various 
percentages of atropine for two years mm -hmm. and then discontinued. And so what they found in that study is that there has been a significant rebound effect based on the concentration of atropine that was used. So one thing to remember about Adam's study specifically is that they had a treatment arm of kids on 1% atropine. And so that rebound was huge. Um, yeah. But obviously we're not using 1% on our myopia patients. So more recently, the LAMP study, uh, LAMP phase three specifically, also looked at kids on two years of treatment. The treatment concentrations were much lower and much more representative of the concentrations that we're using clinically. So the highest concentration in the LAMP study was 0.05%, lowest being 0.01. Yeah. And so in this particular study, when they looked at the rebound, they found that there was a bit of rebound, although not clinically significant. Mm -hmm. However, their caveat to that was the kids who were younger in age when discontinued and then on the higher concentrations of atropine did show more rebound, although minimal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that the concept within atropine is, is, is so much so, so questionable because it may be somewhat dose dependent and how fast do you drop off? And, you know, it, 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 ever since Adam, it's kind of been one of those questions is, is what do you do? And, um, you know, I've talked to different people who over the years who've been using atropine for far longer than I have. And some people just say, you know, I, I really recommend the patients don't stop all of a sudden, but that we maybe go from a 1% if they're at that high to a half a percent to, and whittle them down. Maybe if we're uncomfortable and we're doing as high as a 0.1%, then maybe you could back it down. But, you know, the studies didn't show a huge change. And even, I don't even think the LAMP study of the lowest concentrations. Am I correct in that? Right. 0.01 definitely had the least rebound. Mm -hmm. um, although, like I said, depending on the child's age, some possibly, but overall, the interesting thing is that they found that even when they take into account the amount of rebound for 0 0.05, so the highest that they used, that it still overall is, you know, the preferred or recommended method, at least according to the authors of the study. Yeah. And so from a clinical perspective, would you still, uh, would you still take a 0 0.05 did I say it right? Yeah. Percent <laughs> yeah. patient and, um, and, you know, switch them over to like a 0 0.01 and, uh, and then phase them off of that. It, it, clinically, how would you do that? That's a great question. I mean, I feel like in, you know, 0 0.05, I've been starting to like push a lot more in the last few years. And so I haven't run into a situation where I'm taking my 0 0.05 people off treatment yet because it's mainly I'll put them on 0.05 if they're younger so they're still in their process of being managed but it's a great question I know some like you were kind of alluding to some of my colleagues at SUNY would do a decreased concentration nightly for six months to 12 months or do like an every other day so it's it's tough because this is a question I ask people when they lecture on this topic. I'm like, well, what would you do? <laughs> yeah. And I, rem I remember at one of the um, AOCLE um, conferences, so that's the contact lens educators, um, Jeff Walleen was talking about this. And that was my question to him. I was like, are you tapering atropine or not? And he said, you know, he was like, it's so low, you don't need to. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, if Jeff Walleen says this, <laughs> then yeah. maybe I have the guts to do it too. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I had somebody on a really, really high concentration and they came in, you know, like a 0.1%, which is about as high as we go. Um, and then that patient came in and they said, hey, we want to stop this treatment. Is there a way to do that? Then I may back it off for a month or two, maybe. I don't know that I need to do six to 12 months, but um, again, that's not research backed per se. And to Jeff's point, it's such a small percentage, 
but you just don't want to lose any, right? So kind of an interesting one. Um, what about on the on the other treatment side? Um, do we have any evidence from any research papers that you saw on spectacle lenses? Is there been anything on those sides? I mean, that's so new, even worldwide. I haven't seen any of those papers. Did you find any in your hunt? I didn't see anything specifically on spectacles, although that's a great point. I think that you know, obviously our, you know, our international colleagues have these methods mm -hmm. available to them. Um, and hopefully we will soon too, but I haven't uh, come across anything about spectacle rebound yeah. uh, specifically. What about, well, maybe we can take away and anticipate that if the optics, uh, you know, in some of the, some of the lenses, the glasses are similar to how they are in ortho K and soft multifocals. What about in the soft multifocal arena? How, uh, how do you think about that? Do you, uh, I don't know how you would taper that, but like wear them half the day, uh, if you, if you <laughs> did, but is there anything showing that that sees a big rebound when you cut that off? Yeah, so there's one study, it's an older study, and definitely, um, you know, less ch children were involved in the study, but there was one published in 2016, looking at soft contact lenses with spherical aberration, so acting as a multifocal, and in that study, there were children who were on treatment, specifically the, like, multifocal contact lens for a year to two years and then discontinued for a year and a half after. And in that study, they found that there was no rebound and that regular growth, you know, remained or um, continued after treatment. That one, obviously, you know, given the small sample size and the older study is not as helpful, but for a long time, I think that was like the one study that we had to look at. Although, more recently, the uh, MySight seven-year data has been uh, not published per se, but has been um, announced from Cooper Vision in that, um, again, as we know, patients who are on MySight lenses for either three or six years, in their seventh year of being managed in the, in the study, they were discontinued and just monitored on placebo contact lenses, and they also found that there was no rebound. Yeah. So a more recent study, larger population uh, monitored in the study showing similar results. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, it's not just that these kids stop the progression during treatment and then all of a sudden would have jumped right back to where they would have been had they not been treated is really the takeaway. And with as robust of a study as that seven-year data is, which I'm super glad that we have that, mm -hmm. we can make some big assumptions from that. Um, obviously, we need more data as time goes on to make us better and smarter. Um, I don't know that I know of too many big studies in the ortho K arena for slowing down. Um, anything you found in, in, uh, in that regards to bigger studies or anything? Um, nothing big, but again, uh, like a, you know, one study that I know of is they watched children who were in ortho K for two years and then thereafter, um, they had patients kind of phase out and then remain off ortho K treatment for seven months and then reinitiated treatment in the seven months thereafter. Again, 2016 study, so it's definitely older, but again, we have limited information. So this is one study that we have to mm. take with a grain of salt. Um, how many but, student, how many kiddos were in that? Do you, do you remember the end size? I think you I said it was remember. smaller. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. It was um, one, the initial treatment period were uh, the uh, Comet and I believe Romeo studies. And so those children were monitored for a long time, uh, for two years. And I can find exactly how many children were in those. But um, when they discontinued, it was an option. And then a lot of the parents didn't want to discontinue. And so uh -huh. it was a lot more biased that they could choose like, Oh yeah, sure. We'll you know you know we'll phase out for seven months, and yeah, sure we'll phase back. But some of the parents didn't want to do that, so that's one of the caveats of this particular study. Mm. But they found in this study as well that 
there was a rebound. And so the children who discontinued ortho-K did have an increase in their um, axial length after discontinuing, although once resuming ortho-K wear, things tapered off again. But again, small, limited study, a little bit of bias from the family perspective. Hmm. And, you know, one point is that when we look at animal studies optically, we don't see rebound. And so I think this may be, you know, who knows how truthful this one older study is. Yeah, right, right. Well, excited to see more work come out, but uh, you've done a, a good go job recapping the small amount of data that is currently available. And, um, you know, what do you think? Your concerns about, uh, you know, this as, as a clinician? Are you worried about uh, rebound uh, effect most of the time? Or how do you embrace that clinically? Yeah, I think that, you know, I've been burned a few times from switching and so for that reason, I'm more conservative now in terms of looking at, you know, talking to my patients, if something is working well to trying to dissuade them from switching to something, unless we have to, mm -hmm. although I think one thing to keep in mind, and I think, you know, you had mentioned this before too, is like nothing about discontinuing or switching goes without further monitoring, right? We're right. not just like, bye, see ya. <laughs> like, right. you can stop and I'll see you never. Like, we always see these kids back. And I think that's like really the most important thing, no matter if you're switching treatment, adding treatment, combo treatment, whatever, that, you know, we're monitoring these kids just like we would be if they didn't do any of those things, just to see and make sure that at least on like a person to person, patient to patient basis, that they're, you know, still successful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, fantastic uh, recap there. I, I agree. I'm not super concerned about it. You know, I know kids are going to progress when they stop treatment. It doesn't matter what the treatment is. They will likely progress afterwards, but I just don't want to see a big jump um, and presumably that's not the case, particularly animal studies. And with the variability in these studies, it doesn't really point to, to that directly. And I don't, I don't think that there is, we'll be anxious to see as other research comes available. Great job recapping what we have available and, uh, so glad that you could be on the show. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the myopia podcast. Make sure to like, and subscribe. It's the best way that you can show your appreciation for the project that we're doing. And uh, we'll see you again next time on the Myopia Podcast. Two, three, Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.